Hello and welcome to you all. My name is Umar Harun Malik. I am head of market operations at CPPA and also a board member of Association of Power Exchanges (APEX). On behalf of CPPA and APEX, I extend you a very warm welcome. So, before we move forward, uh, I would like to introduce you to the presenters today. So, the presenters today is basically myself. and we have dr david herbert who is a senior analyst at at envel so in the panelists uh, all three of us will be there to answer your questions that we will we will receive through microsoft teams chat box so here is a high level outline uh, i will cover the energy market perspective and uh, the perspective on electricity markets so this will consume the major part of today's uh, session which is around this will uh, i will take i would say that it will take around 1 hour and 30 minutes it will be followed by uh, the big picture that will be given by uh, dr david on global market transitions in the power sector uh, that will after that we will have uh, you know in between the two important other things are that we will have a break of 10 minutes uh, after an hour or so and we will also be you know serving you all and keep you all busy with the quiz spot quizzes that will come along the way so be ready and attentive during the session and you know we will announce the quizzes that you will give through google classroom and finally important to note and uh, you know for you all is that you may have questions that you would like to pose to us on the presenters so please type your questions in the chat box of microsoft teams uh, one of our team members will be listing them and sorting them and we will be you know we will be answering those question answers in last let's say 20 30 odd minutes and if the questions are some questions are left out we will be posting the answers to those and including the questions that we have answered uh, on our website so some important considerations uh, i would request you all to those who have not signed into the google classroom please do that immediately because it's important uh, we will have a 10 minutes break as i said approximately after 10 you know after one hour of the session has passed Uh, so they will be interactive quizzes so you know just to have good interaction with you guys we got the feedback so we designed it accordingly from you that uh, interaction is important so apart from that to to have interaction we have designed uh, in our methodology to have discussion forum uh, please note that the discussion forum uh, paper and the questions uh, are I, i think they are available on your google classroom uh, and but you don't need to look at them now so you will have a month to answer them so it gives that google classroom gives you guidance that what should be the length of your answer how how the you know what is required all the requirements are mentioned there so you after the session you know you you take your time out and start interacting with each, with each other in that form so now this is the time to start formally start the session uh, which is energy markets overview well as humans we are all blessed that we have abundant energy resources around us that help us in transportation modern day transportation you know industrial use cooling and uh, lighting services household and agriculture the point i want to make on this slide is that the energy changes its form from primary supply to final energy then to useful energy so the primary primary energy is Uh, the energy which is found in in the nature in, in its uh, natural form so that is converted through the conversion technologies into the final energy which is then used by end use technologies and end use technologies uses that final energy to change it to the useful useful energy so for example if we take the uh, this lightning which is which is useful energy it comes from and end technology end use technology which is a lighting bulb whose input is electricity which is coming out of a power plant let's say in in our first example let's take solar and wind so the output here is electricity and the input here is the primary energy which is coming from wind and solar the other route that could be taken here is that this primary energy for example the crude oil goes into an oil refinery and this this final energy out, out uh, output from the oil refinery can either go to a gasoline car 
for transportation or can go into a fossil fuel uh, based conventional power plant which then uses this input final energy to produce another form of final energy which is electricity to light the bulb all right in this slide we will use the sankey diagram to see that what is the share of electricity in the final energy on a global landscape so this slide is uh, representing the numbers of 2020 uh, we have electricity in this blue color here so i want to make a note of this point that in 2020 the global share of electricity uh, uh, in the final energy was about 20 percent so hold on to this number till the final slide of this first part of the presentation and then i will connect it with some other idea So what are the drivers of socioeconomic growth? They are actually population growth, the GDP growth, and the rapid trend towards urbanization. Well, the population growth, we see that there is an ever-increasing trend. Uh, it was around 2.5 billion in 1950s, which has increased to 8 billion now. And in 2050, which is the net zero scenario, it is anticipated to rise to 9.7 billion. So the more the humans are on Earth, you know, the more uh, is, is the load on the energy resources. So, so is the GDP. So in 50s, the GDP was about to tune off about 10 trillion US dollars. Now it is over 100 trillion. So it means that the GDP is sourced from definitely, you know, it is primarily driven from the energy resources which are used uh, on the global canvas. Urbanization. So you see that from 60s till about 80s, this trend was almost identical. Since then, urbanization, you see, it has picked up and the rural population has started because the rural population has started to shift uh, towards the cities. So it means that, you know, there is more need for cooling, heating and other devices that we use in cities. So more, more, let's say, load on the resources that we have on our earth. So because of these three factors that we have discussed in the previous slides, the, the uh, primary energy consumption has increased from 1965 to today four times. You see that it is the 160,000 terawatt hours now from 40,000 terawatt hours. Well, that is too demanding. It is not sustainable at all. And it do have uh, a very apart from you, the positive thing that that is that we have improved our lifestyles, but this is not sustainable because we all know that you know uh, this is this is not sustainable in terms of the resources that we have, and it has a very negative connotation on the environment itself. You see that we are having global warming and climate change all across the globe because of the very fact that. Uh, the the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions in the globe have crossed the 50 billion tons equivalent right so it was around 15 billion here now it is 50 and above so this is not sustainable at all that's why uh, there is a convergence globally towards a net zero strategy by 2050 and it is imperative that we join hands and work towards that so in this slide, the point I want to make uh, before all of you is that HDI is considered a far better index than GDP for measuring a country's development because uh, it considers these three dimensions, which is one is uh, life expectancy, education, and gross national income. Well, before we go on to the next slide, I want to draw your attention and I want you to analyze the next chart that actually exhibits the correlation between HDI and the uh, per capita energy consumption by countries. All right. So, so let me explain the legends. Uh, uh, to you before we go do some analysis here so what we see here on the x-axis you have energy use per capita we have hdi on y-axis and then 
these colors of the circles are basically the continents, for example, African continents and African countries. Uh, we have European continent and European countries here grouped together, see, here. Uh, and the size of each circle actually is representing the population. So what we get out of this is, as you might have noticed also, that there is a very strong correlation, uh, positive correlation between the energy use per capita and HDI, especially in the developing countries. And as soon as it crosses 0 0.8, so this correlation is there, but it is very weak. For instance, if you look at Iceland in 1990, right here, so the energy use per capita was around 400, and when you go to the slide on the right side, portion on the right side, we see Iceland, and the, it has substantially increased around 650. Uh, the number is now gigajoules uh, per capita. So it has increased tremendously. However, the movement in HDI is very trivial. See? So it was less than uh, 0.9 there, and it, ha it, is, it has increased to, let's say, uh, in some points above nine here, point nine there. So, so the thing is that although the energy use per capita has increased substantially, you don't see that strong positive correlation uh, in the movement of HDI, right? So that has moved a little bit. The acceleration is not that much. Uh, similarly, with Denmark, we see here Denmark is here, and uh, uh, Denmark is there, you know. So uh, same trend is seen there as well. However, the, on the other side, in the developing countries, the when you increase the energy use per capita, the movement in HDI is far more accelerated than the developed countries. So this is uh, the thing to note here. Apart from that, uh, another point is about US. We see here US was, you know, the thing is that their use was around 300 plus uh, per capita. Here, the number is around 290. So what happened here is energy efficiency. So they are, they have in a they have increased in HDI, and b they have decreased uh, in energy use per capita. And this is on account of energy efficiency, which is like uh, very well done in US. So let us analyze this slide together. So what this slide is telling us that in order to achieve the net zero scenario by 2050, we need to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions by 36.9 gigatons equivalent carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the global atmosphere. So to, in order to do that, uh, this reduction contribution will mainly come from renewable integration, energy efficiency. And the important point here is that about 20% of this reduction will be coming from conversion of heating and cooking applications to electricity, right? So one, and finally, I want to make a very important point here that as today, we have a share of electricity in the final energy uh, consumed of about 21%. Today, it is around 21%. So by 2050, this the share of electricity in final energy consumption will be, is estimated to be around 50%. So this means that the electricity in the form of final energy will gain more importance and the role of markets that we are going to discuss in the next section becomes even more important. So let's now move on, on to the second uh, presentation or, that I will give, which is about electricity markets. All right. So dear participants, this is our first slide of uh, electricity markets. So before we go into detail of the market architecture, I would like to highlight the important point here that the architecture is dependent upon two major things. One is the goals of the market. The number second thing is the characteristic of the commodity itself. In our case, which is electricity, right? So we need to understand the physical characteristics of electricity as well. We need to define the goals so that they both will inform the architecture of the market that we will discuss in the coming slides. Now, this is also important to highlight here that as the city has huge economic considerations, 
we can't imagine our lives without it right so the, it is very difficult to substitute it is certainly it do have some political implications therefore it is considered as a public service as well right so keep this in mind you know we'll we'll talk about that in the later slides as well right so it it is also considered as a public service it has some implications there as well so in the next few slides we will discuss a bit in detail first the physical characteristics of electricity and followed that will be followed by a short discussion on market goals and then we'll go ahead and do a deep dive in the architecture so we'll move on to the next slide please so when we talk about the history of electricity a very simple question comes to our mind when did we invented electricity did we really invented electricity the answer is no we only started producing it in 1831 uh and then the ecosystem started developing in 1887 we saw the first incandescent bulb 78 we saw the first incandescent bulb put into place it was invented and in 1882 it was the street of new york which was lit with uh, these bulbs uh, through the generators that those were already there uh in the same period in 82 and through 86 the first dc transmission distribution system and the ac systems were put into place as well well it was uh, the earlier 20th century when this discussion started happening then again in new york uh, and other parts of the world as well that this wire network is a natural monopoly and you know it has to be very closely regulated uh, in order to increase its uh, economy you know it, its utilization and uh, save the consumer from its monopolist monopolistic uh, characteristics uh, and later in 1970s the concept of deregulation of electricity industry you know was put on the table and we saw that the pioneers the chilean market took lead in early 80s to start the first comparative market all right so uh, in this slide we will discuss the physical characteristics of electric power system so the first point to note here is that the power system works in an integrated manner from generation transmission to distribution right The second very important point to note here is that the physical aspect of this power system remains the same however the financial transaction they make and vary like in different models from a VIU structure to a very competitive structure right so this is the first thing so we'll build a quick understanding on on the physical characteristic by starting from the load side uh, when we look at the load so load out of two types one is resistive loads and the other other type is you know predominantly reactive loads so in order to feed such load we have active and reactive power which is which flows through the system so what exactly is active power or the real power so this active power or you know you can call it also the real power is required for the resistive predominantly resistive loads so this is actual actual power that is usable power that is consumed or generated by the electrical devices right so we can say that in, in the power that this is the power that performs useful work such as running appliances lights or motors real power is measured in megawatts in watts or let's say you know megawatts uh so and so this is what you see in your electricity bills as well well as far as reactive power is concerned so this is also used you know by by the loads that we have discussed which are predominantly uh, reactive loads so the reactive what is reactive power then so on the other hand the reactive power is that moves back and forth between the electrical devices and the power sources so it does not perform any useful work but it is required for certain devices you know just like motors we have here uh, transformers and uh, you know so so in order to you know help them operate efficiently reactive power is, is measured in volt amperes you know and megawatts also so uh, where this power is generated so this power is generated by the generators capacitors synchronous con con condensers and svcs well apart from this we also need to uh, highlight here that at all times on second to second basis this equation of generation is equal to load per losses has to be equal so to ensure that the, we have a frequency balance of 50 or 60 hertz which vary in different countries so if there is any imbalance uh, in the frequency for example if the generation is higher than the load itself and losses so the frequency can be can increase 
or if let's say the generation goes down and the load is higher this you know the otherwise the the frequency can go down right which can be very catastrophic and it can even result in a whole power system loss and finally uh, the thing that i want to highlight uh, here is that regardless of any market structure the physical nature of the power system remains the same and so are the customer needs so what does the customer expect from us regardless of the market structure they require stable supply at affordable rates so this is a very important aspect we need uh, we when we you know so to consider when we plan to change the market model right so we have to keep this in mind this this very important thing that what our customer requires right so this is one of the targets and or the goals for uh, moving towards any market model so in the next slide i will be describing how it is different from other goods uh, this electricity is different from other goods which is key to understanding operations of electricity markets so let's move on to the next slide all right so in in this slide we will compare electricity with our favorite commodity vegetable which is potatoes you know we all love to eat potato chips right so uh, so when so th the first question is that can electricity be stored uh, economically the answer is yes however it in very small quantities as compared to the total requirement of the system right so even in advanced countries like us the storage capacities are up to 2 to 3 percent of the total requirement in the system, right? So this storage comes in many forms, from batteries, flywheels to pump hydros, and also the use of uh, uh, the storage is typically for ancillary services, peak sharing, and energy arbitrage. Well, you can share as much potatoes you can, right? Economically, we all know that. So this has an implication of storage has an implication with the second point here, in which we are saying that. is the consumption of electricity linked with real time production as we said earlier here yes and here we don't need to do that because we can in this case we can store as much potatoes as we can and we can you know consume them whenever they are required from the stored store you know stored quantities but on the other side we all know that when we switch on the light additional generation must take in you know spontaneously on second to second basis well uh, the third thing which is important to compare between these these two commodities is the uh, role of a central system operator we have never heard of such role in in the potatoes market right but in electric power system the system operator key, you know keeps the equation of energy uh, equal to load plus losses as we discussed earlier in balance at on second to second basis otherwise the whole system can collapse right the system operator can also clear the system operator also clears the generators from for dispatch the physical electricity markets have very tight connection with system operator who is responsible for the dispatch of electricity on real time basis there is no need of such central balancing on real time basis uh, like in electricity you know the, the other markets potatoes can be stored for use later on even in case of imbalances between the demand and supply the whole marketplace does not collapse as in electricity right but here you know if there is any deviation imbalance between the total system uh, generation and the load plus losses as we discussed earlier so the frequency can either drop or can even rise and the whole system can collapse so these were some interesting uh, facts and now we will move on to the fourth important difference so let's move on to, on to the next slide all right so uh, here in the point number 4 5 and 6 we are going to compare these two commodities on elasticity measures on can this be like directed from one, one from the seller to buyer and we'll talk about the nature of deviations of these two commodities right so uh, the first point to note here for electricity as a commodity is that the price elasticity of demand so this is a typical pq curve and we see that for electricity uh, you know the short run price elasticity to demand is low right so it is very low it's you know very close to inelastic so therefore balancing supply and demand requires production facilities to follow large deviations in demand so what does that mean so in order to follow this demand 
different generators are run, right? Resulting in changing of marginal cost of electricity to vary throughout the day, right? So we all see that usually the supply stack in electricity is like this, right? So if you have changing demand throughout the day, the price, which is the intersection here, will move throughout the day. Well, for potatoes, our favorite uh, vegetable, or, uh, you know, we see that if we go to shop for uh, purchasing a uh, few kgs of potatoes uh, and if the price has gone so high, so we will restrain ourselves on that day and maybe not buy that. So it, it's different. So on the next matrix, we see that uh, here, whenever the energy is produced by one generator, you know, we can't, it can't be directed towards one specific consumer in the grid. So this is because the electricity flow follows the least resistant path, right? It is, it is a law of physics that we can't change. Therefore, the energy generated is pooled and is transferred to consumer following the, as I said, certain laws of physics. So in case of potatoes market, right? So what we have here is that any consumer can be supplied the product from any producer. There is an infrastructure of transportation available which can be used freely between the suppliers and demand, right? So, you know, if you want to send uh, potatoes uh, from this consumer to that consumer, uh, seller to the consumer, this can be done. So, physical electrons generated from generator A, you can't say that, oh, I have a contract with a consumer, you know, B, I want to produce here and these electrons should flow there, so that will not happen. Okay. <clears throat> So as far as the last point is concerned, the deviations. So as consumers are connected, you see we all, our houses, uh, they are all connected through a meter with uh, the grid, right? So, so, so what we are doing, so connect, we are connected to electric grid and we can, you know, one can't limit their consumption in real time. Therefore, consumers continue to draw electrical energy as per their instantaneous need. For example, if even it is more than, you know, their contracted amount. So therefore, what happens is that there will always be differences between the contracted and consumed quantities. So in all markets around the globe, these divisions are settled and they will require a mechanism to settle them through the market operator or exchanges, right? So uh, in the potatoes market, we, we do not have any such deviations here. So let's move on to the next slide. All right, so this is the last slide that we have uh, on comparing these two commodities. So, uh, so as you all know that, that the transportation network for electricity uh, is the this transmission network and the distribution network, right? So this T and D network. Uh, the complexity of electricity markets is increased by the effect of transmission system, which has losses, congestions, and other complex stability issues. The electrical energy between the buyers and sellers is transported over these wires, that is transmission and distribution networks. The transmission and distribution networks, because of extensive constraints, uh, they impose restrictions on dispatch that would limit or distort free trading. So here, the system operator also clears the generators for dispatch based on such restrictions and consequently impacts the contracted quantities. So this is important to note because therefore, the market designs for trading has to account for all such factors, right? So in, in this area. Well, uh, when we switch to the potatoes market, there is no such physical network other than the transportation infrastructure. Uh, this is required to deliver the uh, potatoes. The roads are accessible to everyone and, you know, uh, and can be used for purpose of delivery of product at any time and thus free trading is, you know, as comparatively more possible. So this was an important difference between these two quantities. Now, finally, uh, although there are several other differences, but you know, these were eight most important differences. So the last one is that the electricity regulator approves the capital investments in transmission and distribution line expansions. You know, they also approve the operational costs, provides electricity market rules, monitors market based on those rules. You know, they do you know market monitoring in, in some of the markets, uh, issues technical codes for operate, operation of the grid, and you know, settlement of the market, et cetera, et cetera. So these concepts are far, far alien, you know, 
in in commodities market like potatoes so we have a very different role of the regulator in the electricity market so with these important key differences we will now move on to the next slide and you will start discussing the next section so this is the time to reflect we have a small question for you which is this is the question you know on your screen which is also uh, given in your google classroom uh, it will appear in few seconds uh, here we are uh, you are required to classify whether you think that electricity is a private good common club good or a public good right so it it is it is from the economics perspective uh, you have next 3 minutes to answer this question you can you know you use your experience or you can use google to answer this question for you uh, and then you know we'll share the results with you thank you very much all right welcome back so continuing on the physical aspect of the power sector this diagram in front of you uh, this breakdown is conventionally simple and therefore helpful in organizing our thinking so we have different kind of generations ranging from you see that uh, from fossil fuels to nuclear power plants hydros and geothermal biofuel etc the renewables of course we have transmission system in which the power is moved in bulk quantities uh, to the distribution network and in distribution typically we say that this is the final stage where delivery of the electrons is carried to the individual consumers right so however as we all know the reality is little more complicated all right so here we here we see that some large consumers are served directly from the transmission network right so here are some large consumers and there we have also some large consumers of some sub transmission consumers at different voltages some small scale generation like solar pv is located in the distribution network so not all the generation feeds directly onto the transmission network we also see that different transmission and distribution voltages all across different countries so you see that there is a range of voltages here so in pakistan you you know uh, in and all across the world so transmission so primary transmission lines have different voltages similarly this so this is kind of categorized in, as a secondary transmission system and we have different voltages in different countries an additional complication arises from the integrated nature of the power system and the critical requirement of system stability so uh, the next few points are a bit important i would like to, uh, the participant to make a note of this here we will talk about the bulk power system and its relation to the wholesale market right so it is important to note that the bulk power system refers to the delivery of power from generators transmission system to the substations where it is transferred to the distribution network so it does not include the operation of distribution network the trade on the bulk power system is called the wholesale market and it involves generators traders and large load connected to the transmission network right so this large load also is part of uh, the wholesale market they can they usually can participate directly in the wholesale market the retail market is where customers purchase power from the distribution network either from a local electric utility or a competitive retailer or as we see there are you know municipalities also for instance in us the wholesale market sees these retail customers only in large aggregates at the various points where the transmission system delivers power to the distribution network however now as we know things are rapidly changing at distribution level and it has impact on wholesale market technological advances have now made it possible to extend wholesale market structures down to the level of distribution network and we will analyze this uh, in the sessions to come in detail so in the next slide we will compare the price attribute attributable to generation transmission and distribution among different countries so in these few slides 
we will see the cost of generation transmission and distribution that vary across countries and even within the region, regions. So the first example that we have is for Pakistan. So we can see that the transmission and distribution cost is about 20% of the total electricity cost and generation is 80%. In US, in the next slide, we can see that this cost of transmission and distribution increases to about 38% as compared to Pakistan, like 18% higher. And then we move to Canada and see that the costs are now even. The transmission and distribution cost is 50% of the total cost of electricity supply to the consumer. And in Brazil, this is a little bit even higher. So this is like 51%. So in the next slide, we have compared, made a cost comparisons of these four countries across these uh, three components of uh, electricity tariff. So here we see that the transmission cost in Pakistan, you know, the, the cost, they, they vary across the country. So for example, it lowest in Pakistan and highest in Canada, where we see the distribution cost here is 13% and even it goes up higher as, you know, as 39%. So what does this mean? I will pause for a second to let you all think about it. Does this mean that Pakistan has a better design, manage an efficient transmission system than Canada or Brazil? Not necessarily. The higher transmission and distribution costs in US and Canada as compared to Pakistan are mainly due to the lower population density and greater distances between generation and load. Well, in Pakistan, we have about 302 people per square kilometer of land as compared to Canada, where we have only four people per square kilometer. Now, this is, this is the main, main reason. So you can imagine why generation and transmission costs are much higher as percentage of total cost in different regions. So uh, in this slide, we will look at uh, the components of electricity bill that the consumer pay at the end, right? We have already discussed the generation, transmission, and distribution cost. However, we will share some interesting statistics about the other charges, and especially about this one. So what we see is that in several countries, these charges include standard costs, cross subsidies, value added taxes, and at times incentives to promote renewables are also levied here, et cetera, et cetera. And this can range actually from eight to 10% in several countries to even above 50%. All right. So now after discussing the physical characteristics of commodity and cost structure of the industry, Let's not spend a few minutes discussing the institutional structure of electricity industry across the different countries. Well, that will be very interesting. All right, so in this one slide, we will discuss the institutional structure of the industry. There are a few very important points that I want to share with you. Number one is that, that the institutional structure of power industry vary widely across different countries, as well as even widely within the countries as well. As far, far as the ownership is concerned, the ownership of these institutions can vary from state-owned corporations to cooperatives and privately owned corporations that are heavily regulated to privately owned corporations that are competing under the free market regimes. The third point is that as far as their operations are concerned, in some parts of the world, they are, there are single corporations who control all functions as mentioned above, and in other, there are assigned to different entities and a separate entity assigned the role of role to ensure overall coordination and system stability. So here, let's take an example of the system operator function. A system operator may be a state-owned corporation or a publicly regulated entity that directly owns and controls all generators and transmission equipment. Or it could be a public authority that coordinates privately owned generators and privately owned 
network of transmission lines through some market framework. Well, here, let's talk about an ISO model, model, which is a predominant model in North American markets, where the system operations and the market function are performed by one independent entity, which is a separate legal entity than a transmission company. Whereas in a TSO model, which is a prevalent model in Europe, for instance, the system operation function is embedded in the corporation, which is the transmission company as well. Here, I would like to quote one example. Uh, a few months back, I was in UK. I met some of my some of the colleagues in the new UK National Grid, and there I learned that uh, in National Grid UK is just a recent example of a TS model where we have observed that the Ofgem their regulator ordered to separate the system operations from the transmission company, and the government also decided to change the system operation operator's ownership from uh, from the public to private, right? So, so why why they are doing that? So all of these decisions are made to ensure transparency, efficiency, and avoiding conflicts in the decision making of the supply chain. So with this, we will move on to the next slide. All right. So this is the time to uh, take your opinions in writing uh, in Google Classroom. So please answer this question: whether you know what do you think about it. Uh, if your answer is yes, then give us reasons. And if your answer is no, please also write it down in few lines. So you have two minutes to do that, and then please come back to the classroom. Thank you for your valuable input. I would like to share some thoughts here. You know, in an, in an industry previously viewed as a natural monopoly with substantial vertical economies, the introduction of competition has been justified by the perceived benefits of introducing market forces, right? This is the first point. And the second thing is that liberalization is generally perceived and praised in most part of the world for improving transparency showing a clear trend of falling electricity prices and more efficient use of assets in the sector, while some others do critique these results. So it is, I said, it's, it's you know, it's not 100% agreement, it's generally regarded at, as like this, right? The most important point to note here is that liberalization is not just a step, it is a journey. It not only requires strong political commitment, but also a continuous development to reap the benefits of competition in medium to long term, right? So it's, it's a journey, not a step. So let's now move on to the next slide. Up till now, we have now completed the discussion on the physical characteristic of electricity as a commodity. So now let's talk about why restructuring is acquired. What are the goals of restructuring? As you, uh, in my, First slide, we discussed that the market architecture is mainly informed by the goals that you have for a market architecture and the physical characteristics, right? So what are the goals and objectives that we have in general? We all know that uh, through introduction of market, we want, we want to reduce the overall production cost. We want to discover actual costs. We want to promote fair prices to promote new technological development, right? So these are the general kind of targets that we have or goals or objectives we have for opening the market. In developing countries, uh, mainly, you know, the additional that target, you know, the objective that these countries have is to attract private capital to finance expansion and secure consumer electricity supply, right? And moreover, uh, such economies wants to lower the risk of government failures which are often more damaging than the market failures for these type of countries. Well, develop, in, in the developed countries, the more focus is on efficiency and bringing in transparency. So here, let's pause and reflect that what happens to risk allocation with the introduction of competition, right? So I would like pause for like 10 seconds, give you time to think about it.
So before introduction of competition in a regulated structure, consumers bear most of the risk. As already seen, if a new generation technology is invented, consumers will continue to pay more for the older technology. While in comparative structures, risks are initially allocated to investors. So the risk allocation is a bit more fair. However, investors are looking for ways to protect themselves against these risks. So they can hedge themselves uh, doing contracts, using instruments like insurance or financial hedges. So now that we have uh, discussed the physical characteristics and the goals, now it's time to deep dive into the market architecture. So starting from the next few slides, we will discuss initially the timelines of introduction of electricity markets in different countries, followed by some detailed discussion on market structures. Well, welcome to the world of electricity markets. Power market liberalization was pioneered by Chile about 40 years ago. The Chilean reform was followed by the reorganization of British electricity sector in 1990 and then followed by other countries. I would like to highlight here that today the largest wholesale market is in US, which is PGM, and it started operating in late 1990s. Well, it is also important to note that some of the pioneers in electricity market reform have been successfully operating for over a decade, while others have undergone substantial changes in design to improve the performance. For instance, UK. Now, UK started off with the power pool model and then transitioned to a power exchange model. And now, because of several other challenges, including transitions uh, including, uh, you know, one is transmission system constraints, other is VRE integration targets. Now they are seriously considering to implement the security constraint economic dispatch. All right, so in uh, the next few slides, we'll quickly run through the different structures in which electricity industry is organized. All right, so the first structure is the vertically integrated structure of, a, of the power sector in which one corporation or utility controls, owns and controls and operates all these functions. And consumer has literally no choice. It is very heavily regulated end to end. The second structure is the single buyer regime in which you have a central entity. The central entity procures power from the generators. And then all the distribution companies or the load serving entities uh, we call here locally as distribution companies, the LSEs. So they, they, all, they also do procure power from, purchases power from this central agency, right? So, and here we, we also don't have any choice for the consumer. So this is also important to note here that the rate set by the purchasing agency must be regulated because it has monopoly power over the LSEs and monopsony power towards the generators. This model therefore does not discover a cost reflective price in the same way that a free market does, right? Please also make a note here that uh, this single buyer regime is considered as a transitionary step towards introducing wholesale competition. So let's move towards the next slide, which is the third kind of structure is wholesale competition in where we see that here, the, you know, there is an organized wholesale market and the LSEs or the discos, they can purchase power electricity directly from the wholesale market, right? And uh, your traders and other entities and the big consumers, usually the transmission connected consumers, they also can purchase power directly from the wholesale market. So they, the large consumers have a choice while the small consumers are not allowed to directly participate in the market, right? So then you go towards retail. So in the retail market, what we see is that the small consumers, almost all of them, or a big chunk of them, are allowed to procure power uh, from the retailer of their own choice. So they're, they're not bound to procure only from their original load serving entity, the LSEs, right? So uh, the important point to highlight here is that once there is a well functioning wholesale market, the fierce competition between the retailers keep the price competitive and there is no longer any need 
to regulate the price of small, small consumers. Now, th this happens, right? Uh, and eventually, this this is an, an another important thing that in several countries, from experiences has been seen that in retail competition, because uh, the the conflict between the LSE where at times they perform both the functions of uh, retail and distribution. So in many countries, these two functions are legally segregated, while in some of the countries, even they, uh, all the consumers, all of the consumers, in, including the small consumers, have a choice. They have a very uh, well-functioning wholesale market with a threshold down to the level of zero that all consumers are eligible to participate in the market. They still have, they still have uh, these two functions performed by the LSE. So this happens as well. So this slide, this slide actually uh, has all four market structures on the screen. So some important points is from the cost of repetition are that uh, here con consumers have no choice of selecting their retailers. Here only large consumers had that choice, and on, here all the consumers, almost all, you know, depending upon the threshold decrease. So large and small consumers have the choice. I would like to also make a important point here that the organized and designed market that uh, exists are the wholesale markets, and when you reduce uh, the threshold of the whole wholesale market in terms of the consumers who are eligible to participate in the market itself. So when we, then we say that we are moving towards retail competition and the retail competition comes into play comes into play. Well, in the next slide, we will see that uh, on this global canvas that uh, we see that in the developed countries region like North America, this this is like predominantly we have comparative markets here. Also, in most of the developing countries in South America, we have also comparative markets. Also, it is important to highlight that in Asia Pacific region, Singapore is the first place to li be liberalized, you know, in terms of electricity industry, which is the first reform a year coming into place as early as in 1995. In this African region is predominantly uh, VIU and fully regulated. The European region itself is almost all competitive. And uh, we have leading exchanges like Epic Sport, Nordpool that we all know. And uh, then we you know, talk about that's the US. So let me ask you one question here. Do you think that they have VIU structures in some of the states? I'll give you a moment to pause and reflect, and let's try to explore if they have, what are the reasons. Yes, in states, we do have VIUs, and in such, in such states uh, where the VIU structure exists, you know, their decision is, this, such decision is influenced by a combination of economic, technical, political, and regulatory considerations, uh, which includes a either their historical legacy that they want to maintain, or B, the geographical and demographic factors, such as, for example, in some states where there is a very low population density and there are rural areas, the economies of scale might not be favorable for comparative markets. So the VIU may help ensure that all consumers, even those in remote areas, have access to reliable electricity. Uh, the other reasons include, uh, such as, you know, their perception or their belief that they consider the consumers can be better protected and reliably supplied under an integrated structure of a VIU. And yes, the political consideration is uh, very important in such decisions. What is a market actually? A market is a place where the producers and consumers, they meet and uh, to make deals on the product itself, right? So. The deal includes the quantity, the quality, and the price. So they agree on these, mainly these three items. In electricity market, you know, the market may be a collection of contracts negotiated bilaterally between the generation companies and load serving entities without any formal coordination or, or rules imposed. In other cases, the market may be carefully structured with formal bidding rules and algorithms to determine the outcome. Well, the generic label of market 
is used to cover any collection of contracts, bids, trades, and transactions that organizes the operation decisions of the GENCOs, the TASCOs, and the LSEs. So when we speak about the electricity market, we are really talking about several markets in different type of products, such as, for example, I've underlined on the slide. The main one is known as the energy market, where the megawatt hours of electricity are traded. Other markets include capacity and salary, emission and transmission right markets. Well, dear participants, before we go into the break, I want to pay you uh, some attention on this very important slide in which we have megawatt on, or you can say power on uh, y-axis and time on x-axis, let's say one hour. And these are the two trends. Please help me analyze these trends, what they are showing. I give, give you like a couple of seconds to think about it. Let me give you a guess here. So you see that after one hour, I am right down here with very little energy left to continue. So let's take a break and we meet right after 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Well, all power systems involve a sequence of iterative decisions made about power to be delivered in a given hour in more or less the same manner. For instance, years in advance of when power is delivered, it is required to be ensured that there is sufficient investment capacity to supply the demand. Well, within the year, it is ensured that enough of that capacity will be online. And finally, it is ensured that in real time, ESO will have the control over enough generation to make sure that the system total generation matches the demand and the frequency is balanced on second on to second basis. Well, this figure that is on your screen, I will use it to illustrate one specific version of a centralized market. This figure is organized from left to right as the time passes leading up to the moment when the generator produces electricity in a given hour in future. Along this timeline, we have organized the iterative decision making process in four parts. Number one is planning. Number two is scheduling. Number three is balancing and finally in real time close to real time you have operations so under this first phase the planning process begins many years in advance and continues up to as late as the last day before operation. All systems go through extensive planning process to add new capacity needed to meet the demand and determining which generator will be available and which to take out for planned maintenance. The second scheduling phase, which starts at least a day before operation, the SO forecasts the load through every hour of coming day and develops a preliminary schedule of generation to match the load. So under balancing, in actual course of event, load does not change in discrete blocks of each hour, but gradually changes through the hour. So some sort of provision will be needed to fine tune the actual dispatch of the generation through, through that very hour. 
Moreover, as the actual hour of the delivery approaches, events may alter the amount of load expected and which generators are able to serve the load. You know, it can happen that a generator may suffer an unplanned outage after preliminary schedule was finalized in the previous stage or a transmission line may also go out. So the adjustments are required in the schedule. This last minute fine tuning balancing schedule that is more detailed than the preliminary schedule may consist in 15 or five minute dispatch quantities. So finally, the operations phase. During real time operations, further even the detail of a balancing schedule is not fine enough for a stable and secure electricity system. Here in order to match load on second to second basis, the system operator, it is usually simplest to make these adjustments with generation units under the direct control of the system operator. And this gener generation is often procured as a service instead of a discrete units of power, what we call as ancillary services. So this is an, a particular example of a multi, multiple, you know, multi settlement market architecture in which the system operator takes control here and you know this is this is a centralized trading which is integrated with the system operator from this time to this time sorry for this glitch from this time to this time right and this is called bilateral trading So uh, moving forward, you know, we will not discuss the details of uh, these here, but in the, in the coming slide, and especially uh, of all these markets, we will discuss these sub markets in very much detail in session five and six as well. So let's have a short discussion on the forward markets. Uh, barrel contracts are used for all type of electric products, including energy capacity and city services. So let's add, look at this uh, definition given on the screen and uh, make a note of certain terms which are given here and we will then analyze uh, them further. So it says that the contract for future delivery is a forward contract. And number two, a market for such forward contracts is a forward market. And the going price in this market is a forward price. So about the contracts. So the bilateral contracts come in variety of form. On one extreme, we have structured contracts and other are standardized bilateral contracts. Between these two extremes, there are contracts of greater or lesser standardization along many dimensions. The structured contracts cover deliveries as long as 20 to 30 years or even more. Take months of negotiations and are really detailed. You know, ex uh, some examples include the power purchase agreements, PPAs, and the tolling agreements. On the other extreme, the standardized contracts are pretty standard contracts. Now, they can be for immediate delivery or maybe for at any one of the several future dates. They can be agreed verbally or through a click of a keyboard button. They are quite liquid instruments as they can be resold. So uh, all together, these contracts discussed above make up the bilateral market. Although we often speak and write about the forward markets in singular, in fact, there are multiple forward markets and prices as there are several forward contracts distinguished by the date of future delivery. For instance, there may be a one month forward market, a six month forward market, um, and a year ahead forward market as well. Uh, each with its own forward price. Well, uh, the third thing uh, is about the forward prices. So as we all know that the, in bilateral trade, the prices are privately negotiated between two parties, right? Uh, however, the participants in the bilateral marketplace will be keen or interested in prices negotiated by others. So the first source of information are price reporting agencies or PRAs. 
which are companies that gather and publish information on the price of trades, including price assessments. The second source of information are the price reports from exchanges or other electronic trading platforms where buyers and sellers meet and execute bilateral transactions. And finally, the third source of data publicly accessible is the filing, which is mandated by governments. Because of long time lags of this channel, it is not that useful to make decisions. So let us now focus on the spot market. In commodity market, the term spot defines a market for image delivery. Of course, such a classical spot market would not be possible for electricity uh, because of the reason that uh, the system operator needs advance notice to verify that all the schedules are feasible and lies within the transmission constraints. In practice, it is also important to note here that the time horizon that is commonly referred to a spot is determined by the local convention. It could be either the next day or it could be the next hour, depending upon the customs of the region or the country. So we have basically two main centrally organized models in the spot markets. One is the power pool model, the other one is power exchange. And we will explore them in a bit detail and uh, we'll also compare uh, their attributes uh, in the next two, two to three slides. So in a power pool model, so this is a typical organization in which we have a day ahead market, balancing market, and then NCD services. In a power exchange model, so this is, this is a typical organization in which we have a day ahead, intraday market, and then the balancing market. So over time, two main kinds of markets for electricity have emerged, the power pools and the power exchanges. So in a pure gross pool model, all the generation units and the buyers, the suppliers and large industrial consumers, they are required to sell and buy power from the pool itself. The market getting price for an interval, that interval could be an hour, even can go down to level of five minutes, uh, is the intersection of demand and supply curves for that interval, very interval. So, uh, so the thing is that uh, in such models, there are independent system operators, usually typically, for example, in North American markets, which are not part of the transmission companies, which are independent. They are, they are responsible for centralized scheduling of the units. However, usually, you know, there are several exceptions. Uh, for instance, in Philippines and some Latin American countries, ISO model is not implemented and there the SO and the MO are separate entities. And in some cases, uh, the system operator is part of the transmission company. Although it's, it's just a deviation, one deviation of the cross pool pure model. The other deviations may also include net settlement of uh, the quantities which are left out from the bilateral contracts. Well, in some uh, part of uh, the gross food model, for example, in uh, New York ISO uh, and uh, even in PGM, the self-dispatch design is also allowed for some generators to incentivize them to remain part of the pool. So next is the power exchange model. So this is a type of flexibility model in which generators and consumers can choose whether or not to participate. So this means that generators and consumers are not required to sell or buy electricity through the exchange and instead can either enter into bilateral contracts with each other. So these, uh, these contracts are uh, self-dispatched. They are not dispatched by the system operator centrally. Uh, this is the one main difference that we have between the power exchange model and the gross put model. And also the other difference that we see is uh, the role of a TSO itself that I'll, that I'll talk about in a bit. But before that, uh, so it is possible that a supplier chooses to cover its 100% demand through a bilateral uh, bilateral contract with the other generation unit, or it can choose not to do so and buy 100% from the exchange or any combination of that, right? So the exchange is totally voluntary. Uh, so talking about the role of the uh, TSO, the transmission system operator, so this is one legal entity which uh, has both the functions 
trans which is a transmission network operator and a system operator so the role of system operator is here not to let's say centrally call the units for dispatch rather they are informed by the uh, self dispatch forward contracts and the uh, short term contracts you know made in the power exchange uh, so they just ensure that these contracts are dispatchable so in in these uh, two three slides let's compare the two market models uh, on some important features the first thing is that in a pure gross pool the participation of the all generators in the pool is mandatory and they are subject to central dispatch by the system operator which is really an iso as we discussed in the previous slide uh, in on the other side the generators in a power exchange you know it's up to them that they want to participate in the voluntary exchange or not and so that so that they can self nominate or self dispatch themselves uh, the other important feature that we uh, are going to compare is about the uh, who dispatches them so iso dispatches the generators based on the market rules results sorry uh, in this case for example uh, depending upon the pool type is a cost based or you know price based pool so for example this is uh, this is the market clearing price so all these generators this quantity will be cleared for dispatch um, and uh, the other other thing is that initially some of the markets started off this uh, gross pool as cost based pool in which generators were required to submit their uh, variable costs the fuel costs uh, later they transitioned to the price based pool for example pgm is one example of that uh, on the other side the system uh, dispatches the generators based on the nominations or self dispatch and the balancing is done through the balancing market well these nominations uh, include the volumes of all the bidel forward contracts and the result of the power exchange so moving forward in a pure gross pool the iso runs the day ahead intraday and real time markets uh, while in the net pool the power exchange runs the day ahead in intraday market and so runs the balancing market uh, as far as the pri pricing is concerned uh, in pure gross pool we have in certain parts of the markets we have single regional or nodal pricing while in net pool usually we see single pricing or eventually a regional based pricing this model is predominant in north and south america while this is uh, in europe so now that we have discussed the market architecture in some detail it will be good to Uh, make some understanding on spot price fundamentals you know uh, understanding the spot prices and the factors impacting it is one of the most important aspect of comparative markets why because it greatly impacts the comparative position of the parties operating in the market as we all understand that spot price is the result of demand and supply dynamics right since demand and supply both have uncertainties in the long medium and short term therefore such uncertainties are embedded in the spot price formation and we will see in a bit uh, these uncertainties and how they impact them however uh, it is also important to note that the factors impacting the demand and supply dynamics at different time horizons are different and the range of uncertainties are also very different so let's first analyze the the long term uncertainties and how you know for example if you are sitting here and uh, years ahead and you want to forecast the price of you know the spot prices in future let's say annual averages so what are what are the factors that will impact uh the the this forecast so you can see that you know your your long term demand forecast if your demand forecast uh tends if you should demand is higher uh then you anticipate and your demand curve will shift to the right so the spot price for a given supply curve will increase right so you can see that it will be right here um on the other side delay or anticipation of new projects for instance you think that uh, more projects will come that will shift your supply curve to the right that will in turn for the same demand curve will decrease the spot prices and estimation for the future or if you think that some power plants will be delayed uh and you factor that in in your model so in that regard for the same demand curve the the price projection will be a bit lower similarly uh, on the supply side uh, if you anticipate that the fuel prices are going to be higher then the supply curve for for the supply curve will shift upward 
and uh, so are your your anticipated future spot prices so now consider that you are an analyst you want to do some assessments and forecasts in your model for the medium term year ahead or months ahead marginal prices which are monthly averages for, for instance so what you, you will consider in your model here in the medium term the factors impacting the demand supply dynamics in the long run are somehow fixed and known with great certainty however other factors such as seasonal variations in demand uncertainty in renewable energy production and maintenance or planned schedules of power plants impact the demand supply situation so this range of uncertainty is, is small as compared to the long term so apart from this any factors shifting the supply curve to the right such as as an increase in renewable production energy production will decrease the spot price and any factor shifting the supply curve to the left such as large combined cycle plant going out on maintenance will result in in an increase in the spot price so so these shifts and these shifts will change your estimation of the spot prices in the short term the factors impacting the demand and supply in the long and as well as medium term are known with great certainty however other factors such as hourly demand variability instantaneous renewable energy production or force outages greatly impact the spot prices so sudden stoppage or, or increase in wind generation you know for example if the wind speed increases increases that will greatly impact the wind energy production or a power plant with significant capacity going out suddenly on force outage, outage will have a large impact on the spot price so you know these are your uh, hourly uh, projections so the variability because of these uncertainties will be high uh, in in this uh, let's say day ahead forecast or uh, things like that so uh, so what is the use of this so the thing is that commercially speaking the commercial players will use such forecast to decide whether they sh they should do bilateral contracts Uh, should they hedge themselves against the volatility um, in in the organized short term markets uh, or so if they anticipate that for example if they anticipate in the long or medium term that uh, the prices will be lower so they can even decide not to you know do long term contracts or the this you, you know install new generation in the system and uh, procure from the market because the market is long in the short term of because of the estimates so in this very interesting slide that we have prepared for you let's try to simulate a typical dispatch so on x axis we have a uh, number of hours in a day and load on the y axis so initially so let's say this is the forecast in long term uh, that has been done in our in order to cover this forecast long term agreements are done in the market with the base load generators and then we have short term let's say contracts which are done with intermediary or peakers when you go into a uh, near to real time let's say on day ahead basis we see that uh, uh, so this is this is like uh, the volume which has been purchased to cover uh, the the difference between the contracted amount and the forecasted demand and this is the volume which is sold now when you go into intraday you have better information and more accurate forecast so what will happen is that in in the intraday market this volume will be purchased and the remaining excess volume uh, over and above the green line or below the green line the difference between the green and the brown line if you see on the left side this area this is in blue is being sold in the intraday and then comes the real time and uh, the difference in the real time uh, demand and the brown line which was uh, the intraday forecast is the deviations which is settled on the system marginal price at real time so now we'll like to draw your attention to help me answer this question that why every market design is unique around the globe so this is basically primarily based on certain key design parameters that we will discuss in the next 2 3 slides in detail but the main factor you know the, the design choice that distinguishes all the market in two broad categories is the way that we dispatches the generators 
So either they are centralized economic dispatch by a central entity called the system operator, or they are self-nominated by the bilateral contracting parties in which they self-nominate themselves. So we have taken a very representative sample on your screen of these two categories. So in this attempt, uh, what you see on your screen is the markets that are highlighted, you know, the noted in white color are, are primarily, they, they belong to the power pools with the central economic dispatch. And these markets in yellow color, they are power exchange model in which, you know, we have cell dispatch. So even, we will, you know, in the next two, three slides, we will discuss that within the, these markets, for example, uh, in the North, these two North American markets, because of other choices that we make uh, in the key design parameters, they differ. Uh, we will we will zoom in into North America, then we'll zoom in into uh, South American markets to see that how they differ, and then we will compare different countries across the design parameters. Uh, here, you know, the, we we all know that the lead, leading power exchange is North Pool. And we have uh, Epic Spot as well. In Turkey, we have the exchange that we have is uh, EP Ash. And the other thing that I want to highlight is there are certain countries in which we have some sort of a hybrid structure. For example, India. In India, there are provinces or states within which, for decades, there have been a centralized economic dispatch. However, there is a power exchange which is called IEX in India which is, is used as a net pool or voluntary exchange to, uh, for trading. However, now they are con considering to move uh, at the national level towards a centralized security constrained economic dispatch model. So now with this uh, high level background that we have talked about the two major categories, we will try to look into <clears throat> the details of uh, North American markets and then South American markets and then in a table, we'll try to compare that how each market design is different uh, based on these design parameter choices that we make. Well, quickly going through this slide. So this is uh, the North American countries, uh, Canada and US in front of our screen. We do have uh, some uh, participants from this region. And uh, we all know that you know, for, uh, for this region, about two thirds of the population is served through ISOs and RTOs. Well, I would like to highlight one important thing here is that uh, all of these uh, ISOs and RTOs, they do have a capacity market construct. However, these two markets, Alberta in Canada, ASO and Aircourt US, they, they don't have uh, a capacity market construct. They are energy only markets. Well, I would like to also share a very, uh, my personal experience that here, uh, I, we went when we were studying the, and developing the market in Pakistan. So five, six years back, we went there. So there was a lot of debate and discussion at that time going in uh, in Alberta to introduce the capacity market. However, uh, when the government changed, I guess in 1920, so I asked my friends there that what happened. So they said that when the, 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 it was when the change of hats happened, so it was a decision that was made along with the government not to introduce the capacity market. And they, you know, after even a work of three, four years, uh, they are still an energy only market. So here I want to highlight this uh, slide, which is a bit dated of South American market, but the information presented here is very interesting. So you will have it with you so you can, you know, go it through this uh, yourself later on because it is very self-explanatory, but let, let me, you know, uh, just skim through it very quickly. So there are five characteristics given in this slide. Number one is uh, this, which is who uh, is, is, is it a function, very functional uh, wholesale market, uh, competitive market or not, the ownership structure, uh, the, the information about the pricing, that is it a single uniform pricing in that country, zonal or nodal, the, the capacity adequacy mechanism, which is the fourth thing. And the fifth is that how the generators are, because this is a power pool model, uh, are the generators dispatched based on cost or the price? So <clears throat> here we see, for, for instance, in Brazil, we have, we do have a zonal price, 
So now this ownership structure has changed. Uh, they have about 60, I guess, uh, 64 DESCOMs or LSEs. So all of them have been recently you know, privatized. Most of them have been privatized. Uh, the thing is that apart from this, they do have a separate system operator and a market operator. When we compare this with uh, Argentina, a neighboring country here, so things are a bit different uh, because they do have a nodal pricing regime. And uh, I would like to say that they do have an ISO model in which the system and market operations are done by one entity there. So, so this, is, this, this slide shows us that even within a very close uh, region which have uh, this almost the same socioeconomic values, kind of uh, same culture. They are tightly, they are connected, but even within, within them, because of several reasons, how different they are. So the, here are very two interesting slides in which we will be discussing about 12 design parameters or design choices based on which uh, every market design becomes unique. So, uh, so this is actually coming out from our practical experience uh, of last eight, nine years in which we actually, when we were designing the wholesale market in Pakistan, so we always were like uh, kind of asking this question that uh, what design should be implemented in Pakistan uh, for opening a, a wholesale competitive market. So uh, the thing is that we studied almost all these markets uh, that are mentioned on the right of your screen. And we found out that it is the design choices that you make on these parameters based on your local conditions that makes every market design unique. And you know, the, we got the answer why also that we shouldn't be making these design questions. So I will be qu quickly going through uh, this slide. So the first thing is the parameters then the options uh, that we have under those parameters and then a few examples. So starting with the integration of legacy contract, when you start a competitive market from let's say a VIU structure or you have legacy contracts uh, which are long-term and to integrate them and they are very protected. They, they park almost all the risks on the consumers. So when you try to integrate them with the market, new uh, competitive market regime in which you have to share the risk. So, so the investors who are already protected by the uh, by their PPS, you know, or the contracts, they don't want to do that. So if you have several choices. So this is this is never recommended. Uh, other choices include, for example, you contractually buy out them and then integrate in the market. One example is Philippines. There that they did it. Uh, the other is, for example, adaptation adaptation of the market design. Uh, itself we don't have so deep pockets. For example, in Pakistan, we did that. So we have not modified the PPS, we have protected their revenues and we have modified the market design in a way that the legacy contracts will be integrated into our wholesale market. Uh, moving on to the next uh, parameter, which is security of supply. In order to secure the, the supply, the, we have two options. Either we can leave the security of supply onto the market forces on the price signals, so that investors can come or not. So uh, which are the example of energy only markets mainly, or it could be insured through a central obligations. So we have uh, EU markets primarily based on, on this, and we have US markets in which we see centralized capacity obligations. We do have that in Pakistan's design as well. Now, the next parameter in which uh, this is about the power procurement. So this is primarily talking about that how energy and capacity is procured. So let's discuss a few examples here. So uh, for example, here in uh, US, California ISO, in order, to, in order to meet this centralized capacity obligations, uh, the participants can do bilateral contracts. Uh, while in PGM or, uh, or New, York, New York ISO, they run centralized cap uh, capacity auctions uh, for the participants. Uh, similarly, in Pakistan, we do also have uh, centralized capacity obligations and we leave it to the participants to do firm capacity based contracts in order to meet those capacity obligations. Finally, this is also important when you are opening the market, it is always recommended that you uh, start with the wholesale market. As we discussed in the previous slide, what does the wholesale market means in which you have uh, large consumers, initially they have a choice, right? Uh, so it is recommended, especially for developing countries that you start with a wholesale market and you gradually transition towards the retail, uh, towards the retail. So in, in the, what does that mean? You know, the thing is that there, there are several criteria all across the globe in which the 
you know the threshold is defined for example in several countries it is based on voltage megawatt of capacity of the load itself or the energy that the loads use uses in a year so if we uh, convert uh, let's say this into the into the megawatt terms so i will give you some example for example brazil started off with the threshold of the consumers which was initially 3 megawatts and now it is down to 1 and now they are deciding to move towards you know even further lowering it india and pakistan we both of these countries generally have uh, india and most of the states have 1 megawatt or above consumers uh, those consumers those have load 1 megawatt or above they are allowed to participate in the market while remaining consumer don't have a choice so the so the message is that in the developed countries we have seen a very rapid and quick transition from a wholesale towards retail while one exception was in us and texas in which they did a big bang and they started off uh, initially uh, with the, giving the choice to all the consumers however uh, all other countries like turkey even they started off uh, with the big consumers first and then they moved very quickly towards the retail market now and you know now the every consumer in turkey even is like you know for several years have a choice to participate in the market so so this is uh, the important thing and you know you do have to take care of the readiness of people process technologies and other things uh, legacy contracts the obligation that you have on it uh, for opening the market speed because it depends upon the readiness of all these factors that i have talked about so now we will move on to the next slide and discuss the fifth design parameter so when a consumer gets an open access uh, and participates in the market uh, so there are several choices that we can make on the open access charges in many countries uh, the only you know the grid charges that that means the wire charges and other margins uh, and you know the fees fees of the operators are paid uh, in other countries grid charges plus standard costs uh, were applicable when they started off and in several countries you know even now and especially in developing countries we have grid charges plus cross subsidy and strand costs being implemented you can see the examples in front uh india is an example which you know they in pakistan also now we do have cross subsidies in the system because the larger consumers cross subsidizes the smaller consumers because they, they because of their higher cost of service so uh, there is a huge amount of charge now this this could be considered as one of uh, the barriers to open the market uh, in, on a quick speed and bring liquidity in the market however if uh, these charges are not paid by the consumer leaving the leaving the local distribution company or its incumbent supplier then you know this this cost will be stranded uh, in the system or it has to be picked by the government and they will you know they will have to increase the taxation to do that so this is a challenge also so th this is uh, after this we will discuss you know i think we have discussed in detail about the dispatch criteria I'll leave that we have also discussed in detail market architecture and uh, institutional structure as well a few words about uh, the dispatch criteria i think we we're sorry this uh, power procurement by low performing discourse now uh, this is for the developing countries in which for example for instance let's say uh, in countries like pakistan in which there are a few distribution companies in certain regions uh, in which if you let's say allow them to procure power from a central procurement towards a barrel procurement then the issue is that their tariffs definitely will increase and the socio economic conditions of those regions are not good to to you know uh, incorporate those higher tariffs and pass it on to the consumers so uh, for to do that initially for certain time until the performance of those low performing regions increase a combined procurement can be done just like in case of pakistan and as there are different in a little, little bit different context is an example of brazil in which uh, centralized auctions uh, are mandatory for their discounts uh, to procure power from but that is a different thing because they want to they have they have to procure hydros and other strategic projects uh so this is a, this, it has a different driver in brazil and finally about uh, the market index which is the market clearing price so we see uh, you know we on one end you know it can be as short as 5 minutes for instance in ontario or canada uh, and alberta and other markets and you know to 1 hour 
So in Brazil, Pakistan, and several other markets, still we have a market clearing price that is uh, representing one hour. All right. So, so in this table, uh, and then in in the next two odd slides as well, what we have tried to do that across several countries from different regions, we have uh, given some examples that how their dispatch criteria, market architecture, the products, the index, you know, the mar marginal price, the market market clearing price, and the you know contracts that they undertake, and the market structure makes them different. So this is something that we actually. Uh, when we were researching a couple of years back, we did that. So we have updated these slides as well. But you know, because the market keeps on evolving, so uh, pardon us if that if some information is not that current. But we have tried to make it current. So you know, we talk about dispatch criteria and we compare them between Alberta, New York, and Brazil. We see that these two markets have price-based dispatch and they have cost-based dispatch. Although all belong to the same category of a power pool. Now, in the market architecture, you see here in this power pool, there is no day ahead or intraday market in Alberta, but you, you see this in New York and also a real time market in Brazil, right? So, when it comes to the product, so you see that here we have in Brazil energy and capacity both as products. Here, Alberta has energy only market, therefore, they have energy and city services. And we have seen a lot of products here in New York, which is a very well advanced market. So as far as the market index is concerned, we have a market clearing price, which is five minute marginal price in Alberta. We have 15 minute uh, location based marginal price in New York, while you know the marginal price calculated in Brazil, it, it, quite, it is quite complex and it is an hourly basis. Uh, it is based on several algorithms and stuff, uh, so and so forth. So, uh, so as far as contracts and market structure is concerned, they also are different as you can see on the screen. So let's move on to the next slide. So we have uh, other few markets to compare and we see that in terms of product, dispatch criteria, uh, margin pricing and contracts and market structure, they are really different. So in this slide, for instance, we see two uh, net pools or uh, voluntary pools, what we call power exchange models here. So, so, so the Turkia has a self-dispatch or a power exchange model, and they have recently also introduced the capacity market, which is run by uh, TE Ash, which is their uh, TSO, transmission system operator. So they are not trading capacity product as well. Uh, this is some information about their marginal price that they have. And then, you know, you see that they have a TSO, which is part of the TNO here, uh, which is a bit different from Denmark. And, you know, India is altogether a different market. So now a few important uh, words about the discussion forum. As you all know that we have, uh, as part of our design teaching methodology, we have discussion forums as part of it that will be open between the sessions. For the first discussion forum, we have uploaded a paper from Arena, and uh, you know you can see the guideline. There are some questions that every participant is required to answer. Number one, and please follow the guidelines as given in the discussion forum in the Google Classroom. We have just recently uploaded uh, these questions and that paper. So this interesting paper is related to the distributed energy resources. Uh, and this report actually talks about the distributed energy resources with respect to their integration in the market design. So it covers that how it works, how it is integrated in the wholesale markets and ancillary services and capacity markets, what benefits the power sector gets, system gets out of it, what are the key enabling factors. And you know, there are certain snapshots or shots of certain markets like New York ISO who have already done it. So it has been discussed and especially the challenges in, in the integration are also discussed. So we have uh, designed a few very interesting questions uh, that you need to analyze this uh, paper report from Arena, which is available on the link and it is in public domain on their website. And that will help you 
answer these questions. And you can, you know, as we discussed earlier in the discussion forum, you can either make a direct post or can reply to a post already done by your colleague. So this will make, you know, us to collaborate and, you know, share thoughts uh, and interact as we move along in the session. Thank you very much, Umar, for that very enlightening session. And now, before we move on to the next session, I would like to make two important announcements here. First of all, the discussion forum question is live, so you can start your comments. And secondly, after the next session, immediately after that, we would also uh, upload the quiz number three, for which is the post assessment for this session. So now it, it is my immense pleasure to invite Mr. David Herbert, who is a PhD in public policy, and also he is a distinguished member of Market and Policy Group with Strategic Energy Analysis Center at NREL. Sir, please take over. Thank you very much. And quick check, can you see my slides on the screen? Yes, sir, I can see your slides. Okay, great. Well, I want to follow up uh, on uh, some of the themes that uh, that Omar Saab uh, introduced in, in his presentation, except I'm going to take a little bit different uh, perspective. Uh, I'm going to uh, try to look at kind of what's going on globally with some of the major changes that are going on. And there are some changes, some global transitions, even though there are different market structures all over the world. I like to think of it as, as one single tide that's out in the, the economic ocean, but it's affecting the coastlines of different countries in different ways. And I think those differences are, are highlighted in, uh, in what Omar Saab presented uh, in his presentation. You saw a large variety of, uh, of market structures, market designs, different considerations. Different countries have different factors affecting these, these global trends. Uh, for example, the role of states and provinces in the uh, historical regulation of the power sector in the United States and in China and in India. States had a very states and provinces have historically had a great role. And so there is this tension between sort of a national policy and the, the legacy of state regulation. Um, the, the ability to uh, uh, to develop liquidity in the markets that changes from country to country. So all of these factors are affecting these various these these global factors that are changing uh, how electricity is generated uh, across the world. So in um, in economics, there is a theory called creative destruction. And this theory says that there are advances in technology and every so often these technological advances create disruptive changes in, in the economy. And these come from within. These are not the result of government policy, although government policy can decide whether to, to, to navigate the currents uh, with the currents or try to uh, oppose the currents. But basically what happens is that uh, in creative destruction, old capital investments become obsolete um, and the formation of capital seeks out modern technologies, new technologies that have more utility to businesses and individuals. It's not just a matter of, of economic efficiency, but it's a matter of usefulness to to individuals and to companies. Omer began by looking at the differences between the HDI and the and GDP as indicators of, of well-being. Um, well, creative destruction really speaks towards the HDI, the, all of the, uh, the qualitative aspects of development that, that improve the, the, the lives of individuals in the economy and improve what, uh, what businesses can do within that economy. Um, you know, uh, it's not that, that mobile phones are more efficient economically. They, they bring an important dimension to, to all aspects of individual life, uh, access to healthcare, access to uh, or the ability to network with, uh, with friends and, and, and others and to, uh, you know, to sort of expand your field of vision. 
these are examples of creative destruction that basically phase out at old technology and replace them with a new technology. And as like I said, government cannot really start or stop this change, but government can do things like uh, helping the the uh, the labor market adapt to new technologies easier, or or uh, or resist the technologies. And an example uh, is you know we can we can see this. Uh, happening in the United States or how it happened in the United States from uh, 2017 to 2020, there was an administration that very much supported the use of coal. And yet during that same four year period, we saw a record level of coal plant retirements, coal capacity retirements during this change driven by this technological evolution uh, that I'm speaking about. And I want to talk a little bit about how this evolution affects different aspects of the power sector, because I think this might provide some big picture context for the the changes that you're seeing in your countries and your markets um, uh, and how these global changes would be affecting these markets in these countries differently. Um, and it, I think it's also important to, to note that decarbonization of the grid is happening in many parts of the country as a result of creative destruction. But this is really, in my view, kind of a byproduct of the power sector's evolution, not necessarily the underlying reason that the evolution is happening. There's a momentum there that I think is, is carrying this forward. So let's look first at the evolution of infrastructure. The first thing and and, and Omar saw mentioned this in in his presentation. Um, the, the production of electricity is no longer a natural monopoly. It began that way, certainly. But today we're seeing um, an increasing ability of merchant generators, independent power producers, who can build plants more efficiently than the regulated utilities. So so this is kind of disrupting that that sense of a natural monopoly. Now, government policy might prefer to maintain the you know, the the um, the function of of a monopoly and regulate the sector as a monopoly, but that's no longer becoming a natural necessity uh, uh, coming from the virtues of how electricity is generated and delivered to customers. One aspect of this this lack of natural monopoly is that central station generators, large central station generators are no longer the pinnacle of economic efficiency for generating electricity. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we, when we address finance. Um, more generally, we're seeing the cost of utility scale wind, solar, renewable technologies falling fairly significantly over the past 10 to 15 years, as you can see uh, by the chart uh, on the right. At the same time, we're also seeing that scarcity is making the cost of fossil fuels higher and more volatile. Uh, not only you know physical scarcity, but supply scarcity due to armed conflict, as as we're seeing in in, uh, in Europe. But also this this scarcity is changing from one country to another. In some countries, you know, for example, Philippines and Bangladesh, the the local supply, local reserves of natural gas um, are not expanding. They're being depleted and, uh, and the exploration is not keeping up with the growth and demand for these uh, uh, for, for natural gas technology. So there's scarcity and there's volatility and this is putting upward pressure on the fuels that a lot of these technologies need. Also, at the same time, all this has been happening. We've seen significant improvements in grid operations, uh, the ability to incorporate weather forecasting uh, and to improve day ahead scheduling uh, that makes dispatch more precise. This is particularly important with respect to um, uh, to uh, the integration of wind and solar technologies that that improve the ability to to identify what the next day 
hourly profile is going to be for these resources, combine that with the low profile, and then identify the, the amount of flexible resources that are going to be required and when those uh, those resources are most likely to be required. So, so, so the operation of the grid and the capital investment going into the new technologies uh, fueling uh, generation, those are changing uh, by virtue of, of, uh, of how uh, costs are falling and how technology is improving. Let's look a little bit about the evolution of energy markets. Now, in addition to all the details that Omer saw, uh, uh described, a number of general observations come out. First of all, resources with greater operational flexibility are becoming more valuable. This is because of the increase in wind and solar on the system. The the nature of wind and solar, the, the inter-hour and hour-to-hour -hour variability, and the ability to forecast that variability with increasing accuracy day ahead. So, so this, this creates an opportunity for, uh, for these flexible resources that can meet that difference between renewable generation and load, it, it adds a degree of, of value, not just in terms of the megawatt hours and you know, that can be delivered, but the fact that these resources can deliver it with greater flexibility. Um, and as as these as the slow moving central station generators like coal are retired, and as they're replaced by fast changing wind and solar and the operational flexible techlo technologies like batteries and, and demand response, it is becoming increasingly possible for fast moving markets to release, our, re release value that, that previously had been covered up by uh, looking at just simple day ahead, you know, day scheduling or hour scheduling. There are sub, um, sub hourly uh, increments of, of dispatch that will have uh, have greater value and this is the sort of value that that slower markets just the, the one day markets or the one hour markets uh, previously left on the table and as these these changes continue these sources of value are going to be more and more important and we'll see and we we have seen in many markets bilateral contracts and self scheduling giving way to security constrained economic dispatch. This is one of the big drivers behind that change that we see in many in many countries. Hourly system wide marginal clearing prices that we see in balancing energy mechanisms give way to five minute locational marginal prices that do a better job of capturing that that time granular value of the difference between load and and generation. Um, another major uh, factor is that technology is enabling electricity customers to be more sophisticated in how they use electricity. Remember one of those earlier graphs that Omer showed about, uh, the, about load and demand intersecting the supply curve for generation. Traditionally, uh, say 20 years ago, that was treated as a very inelastic uh, quantity intersecting that demand, uh, that uh, supply curve. Today, we're seeing a, an increasing ability of demand response to participate in the market. And that is an important part of price mitigation because if load is able to respond to higher prices by pulling back its demand and responding to what would other be higher prices in the market, that that adds some <clears throat> um, that adds some flexibility to the market and uh, greater integrity to price formation and greater confidence in in uh, in uh, what what prices will will be in the future to to signal the direction of of new capital investments. So let's look again look a little bit about how this affects finance because this in one way or another affects every country in every market. Um, the first thing that we notice is that large central station generators, which were never really a good 
private investment anyway uh, are becoming uh, really scarcer and scarcer. These investments always required some sort of government underwriting, either as a direct finance or finance through rate base, which was guaranteed through the state uh, for cost recovery from, from customers. There was always some, some guarantee provided by the government for these large st central station generators. We're seeing less and less of that now, and a lot of the risk is is moving uh, from uh, from the public sector to the private sector. We're seeing that private capital is increasingly able to finance medium-sized generators, especially renewables, but this enables more of a right-sizing of new capital investment to uh, midterm projections about what the uh, what the new resource requirements are going to be to maintain resource the resource adequacy that Omer mentioned uh, during his presentation. And this tends to move the risk of investment from the public sector, which was underwriting it through rate base, through government you know, direct government investments and guarantees. And it moves a lot of that risk to the private sector. Now that does a couple of things. Um, it makes it makes um, better use of direct private investment uh, more uh, more feasible. It also means that the ability to attract that private investment will directly depend on the quality and the integrity of the market. Are prices transparent? Is the process efficiency efficient? Are the outcomes trustworthy? Uh, 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 with respect to you know, a, a real representation of the intersection of supply and demand. Now, all of this changes the relationship between the state and the power sector. Um, as I said at the beginning, initially, um, uh, uh, the power sector was treated as a natural monopoly and it was regulated as such. Uh, very closely, monopoly franchises uh, granted by the state um, and control by the state over the prices that were charged to customers, the investments that were allowed to go into the utilities rate base or the, the utilities capital base, all of that was, was controlled and approved directly by the regulator. With competition, as natural monopoly becomes less inherent, uh, more activities in the electricity supply chain can be opened up to to various suppliers and competition among those suppliers. We've seen this in several markets in developing countries for generation. Um, uh, a lot of uh, participation by independent power producers, merchant generators. We've been, even seen it in some markets uh, for retail service. Um, and as a consequence of that, prices can be set by competition, the intersection of supply and demand rather than the regulator. But this creates a brand new role for the state in the regulation of the private sector. It doesn't mean that that regulation stops. I've never really liked the phrase deregulation because there really, in my mind, is no such thing as deregulation. You regulate differently. The regulator focuses on circumventing anti-competitive behavior. It focuses on identifying sources of market power and mitigating that market power so that the so that the market results and the prices that come out are not distorted or not manipulated by market participants who might be able to undermine the natural outcomes of a competitive market. So that's a very important new role for the regulator. The regulator has uh, the regulator has a number of tools uh, in doing this um, uh, to to assess market conditions. The objective is to sustain fair competition, not necessarily low prices, but efficient prices, prices that are sufficient to incentivize new capital investment when those investments are necessary for resource adequacy. 
The first response is always going to be to improve market design. And this is why when we look at any market in the world, what we see today is not what we saw 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Every market evolves, every market improves. It improves not only because of technology, but because market participants become smarter, they become more, uh, uh, more able to identify their, their interest and respond uh, with, um, uh, with better precision uh, to, to market responses. Ex post price adjustments are generally a last resort response um, because the objective is for the prices that are revealed in the market. It, it's important that those prices be, uh, be good enough to signal um, uh, long-term trends, not only the prices themselves, but all the things that affect how those prices uh, resolve. Um, those are the things that private investors, that uh, investors in, in new generation will use to make decisions about whether or not to put more capital, new capital in that given market. Um, and as has the state no longer unwrites the risk or underwrites the risk of this capital investment. Um, this increases the, the, the importance of price signals as, um, uh, uh, as an input. Um, so this transformation uh, brings with it a number of opportunities. Um, competitive markets are a step towards taking advantage of how the power sector is evolving. So so it's not it's not simply the case that everyone woke up one fine morning and and decided oh well let's have uh, competitive electricity markets. There are there are underlying reasons why these competitive markets are opening up new opportunities uh, that were not available before. Um, it involves it, it opens up new opportunities for private investment to participate, which which changes the balance of. Uh, of risk management between the public and private sectors. Um, and proven market efficiency and confidence will tend to reduce risk. This is important, especially for developing countries, because the ability to manage risk in a rational way will reduce the cost of finance, and this will address uh, some of the uh, capital capital problems that we've seen in, in a number of countries. Now, a big caveat is that a competitive electricity market needs oversight. Um, I've been working very closely with the regulator in Pakistan, as I have in other countries, uh, on the development of market monitoring. Um, the state, as I said, does not control prices, but it needs to watch very carefully how those prices are formed. It needs to make sure that no one in that market has market power. And if they have market power, those market participants need to be mitigated so that they don't have the ability to exercise that market power and control prices or control who can enter into the market. So this is, so this is a new role. It requires constant monitoring and a new type of partnership between the independent system operator and the regulator and market participants. So the thought I'd like to close you, I'd like to close out with, uh, which uh, something I want to follow up uh, something that, on something that Omer mentioned is that market tr transformation is a continuous process. Market participants adapt and they, they discover new sources of value as they learn how to work in the markets better. So there are increasing efficiencies, efficiencies that are revealed by the, the evolution of technology. And this technology is going to cause old technologies, this old technologies to fade into the, into the past, new technologies to emerge, and these are going to be disruptive. Um, but in, it increases the need for transparency and vigilance against uh, against uh, manipulation and gaps in market design. All markets improve over time. Um, and that is what I've seen over the past 24, 25 years that I've been in this business as a market monitor in ERCOT, 
Um, and as, uh, as an, uh, an analyst with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, these are themes that I've watched evolve and that I've helped, I've tried to help uh, 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 countries and uh, market participants all over the world uh, try to understand so they can keep ahead of these, um, um, these trends as they are evolving. So with that, I will um, turn it back over and we'll move to our next phase. Thank you very much, Dr. David, for that enlightening session. And uh, before we move on to the Q&A session, I would like to make a few announcements. Firstly, uh, in the best interest of time, we have identified six to seven questions which were very key, and we would be discussing them with our panelists in the Q&A session. The remaining questions will also be answered, and the answers will be floated to you via email. And now I'm going to uh, make uh, the post-assessment quiz of this session online. You have eight minutes to solve the quiz, so best of luck, and we'll see you after eight minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, David. So this uh, is going to be our last part of the presentation that they have uh, given on the Google. Sorry for this glitch. Uh, so uh, the thing is that we have received several questions. Juan said earlier, uh, there are certain questions which, uh, in in the best interest of time, we will, you know, they are very simple, and we will answer them. We will answer all the questions and put it on, you know, email it to you and put it on website. One. However, we have identified uh, five to six questions which were deep enough for the discussion room session. Uh, David, uh, you already know him. The other is uh, George Bercher. He is a senior partner in MRC, which is a leading consultancy, consultancy firm in Spain. So, uh, hi, George. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure if you are here. Hear me? Because uh, it was my yes. micro <laughs> disabled. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So, we can hear you. good afternoon or to everybody. Or good evening for some, some of you. Have a good day. So, only, you know, uh, as presenters, myself and David can answer you. Uh, so let's start the session. So I'm going to be the coordinator. Uh, I have sent you both the questions as well. So we will start with the questions. Uh, so the first question being asked, so I will take that, that's, it, that is very easy. So one of the participants asked that, considering the high prices nowadays, you know, which is like uh, prices of commodities and everything, inflation is very high across the globe. So the assumption that uh, the electric, electricity prices are the, the electricity demand is an inelastic to the, these high prices. Is it correct? Well, the answer is uh, that electricity in the very short term is definitely inelastic. But as David said in his presentation, that there is a certain part of the load, which is uh, interruptible load, uh, who also participate in the market and know oh, they can be interrupted in real time through electrical devices based on the price signals. So what happens is that if the prices are high, so they agree that the load will be reduced. So that is like, a, you know, the, the effect on the overall system is like adding generation in the system. So only, but that is a very small proportion. Despite of that, all the main part of the load uh, is in an elastic in short term. However, uh, in the medium to long term, definitely, you know, as the prices increases, um, me, myself, in my house, you know, uh, I go out to my family to switch off light, air conditioning load uh, at the high prices. So everybody goes for conservation or efficiency. You know, you install uh, light emitting diode bulbs, LED bulbs, you know, you try to conserve uh, at the peaking prices, which is if you plug in Pakistan, for example, we have two part tariff, peak, peaking prices are very high than off peak prices. So we conserve and we make ourselves efficient as well. So definitely in, in the medium to Longer term, you know, uh, we we uh, the, the there is is the load is definitely elastic as compared to the short term. So I hope I've answered this question. Uh, uh, sorry, Omar, may I add a little bit about this? 
just uh, yeah, but please go ahead. Oh, okay, now it's a very. Uh, I fully agree what you have said, but probably okay. The, tie, the things are changing nowadays, and uh, gradually, even in the short term, the demand is becoming somehow elastic. All these programs uh, permitting the the load to participate in the market, to the demand side management or whatever, can be interpreted of some kind of elasticity of the demand. The major problem is that it's something that is happening, and so there are not enough or sufficient studies or analysis to analyze if this demand side management and the prices are transforming in some kind of elasticity to these prices. But in general, uh, even the short term demand, that means the, the short term, is gradually becoming elastic, but not as elastic as in the medium term. So uh, there are right. no, no particular yeah. studies that I know at least that has been done trying to relate the number of people that participate in demand side management versus the prices, etc., to, as to obtain some representative values. Right. So this is something that is but, happening nowadays. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I, I think we got it. No, that, that's a thank you, a brilliant perspective. David, would you like to add something or should we move to the next question? I think we can move ahead. I think uh, you've covered everything. Uh, that, that sounds good. So I'm reading out, uh, David, this is a question for you. Uh, one of the participants asked that how price spikes are handled in energy only markets. Can you yeah. help us uh, understand that, please? Sure. I mean, it, in all markets in the United States, price spikes are handled by some combination of price caps and forward capacity market. Um, if the, the pattern is, if you're not relying on capacity markets to provide that extra capacity based revenue, for generators, then you rely on uh, price spikes or you know in, increases in prices to provide that additional revenue. Now, that has some uh, some economic and political uh, risks as well. Um, if there is an extreme disruption uh, that causes prices to to just you know immediately jump to the price cap, then um, you know, first of all, it, it, it creates a very uh, large economic burden. I mean, not just on customers, but also on all parts of the, of the power supply chain. Um, but it also sort of violates uh, uh, kind of a, a, a fundamental premise of competitive economic markets that you should be able to respond to the price si signals. Um, if that price spike happens so quickly that that the people who bear the brunt of them don't have the ability to respond to them, then well, that's a problem because it's not communicating the right signals. Um, so that's something that um, you know that has been evolving over time. Um, the uh, uh, you know energy only markets will sort of look at recalibrating their price ceilings, their price caps. Uh, uh, in the event of, um, uh, of, of extreme events. They'll also have emergency reserves. So for example, if there is an unusual event that basically causes an extraordinary number of forced outages, uh, there will be emergency reserves uh, that would kick in. Um, but really the accurate answer is that energy markets are still trying to figure this out. And as we have more examples of of disruption due to extreme climate change events. Um, the imperative to address grid resilience as a distinct form of value from reliability, that is becoming more and more important. But because it's such a new question, you know, all markets are still trying to figure out how to do that because it's a different economic calculus. OK, thank you very much, uh, David, for adding this. Uh, George, on the same note, would you like to add your thoughts to, uh, about the capacity market construct? So is this another mean to control the spikes? 
Well, uh, the, there are different approaches to control the spikes and uh, at the same time to promote enough capacity is installing the system. And this is a debate that has it was it, it can be considered some an, a solved problem in the past until the moment uh, the batteries enter into the market and so uh, the issue of how to control the batteries and how to use the batteries to provide enough capacity should be discussed so this aspect of capacity it should be paid it should be a market should be a combination of, to of both uh, is nowadays again under discussion uh, in the past, the capacity market can be handled almost separately. Uh, that means uh, through incentives. That means paying for the capacity that is on the system, even if this capacity is not used, or uh, it, it was managed through auctions conducted by the system operator or by the market operator, usually by the system operator, that procures enough capacity so it ensures that enough capacity is in the system to uh supply the future load regardless or regardless between quote about the short term prices in the market this point is now again uh, nowadays again under discussion as i said before because how to manage the issue of the batteries that there is another question about that that i can elaborate later on but in general, uh, the issue of the capacity is managed in the different markets around the world, either through some payments, special payments, uh, administrative payments could be in some cases in some markets or uh, some payments linked with the scarcity of the capacity in the future or through auctions. These were two major avenues to control the, the capacity into the system. Uh, all right. Sorry, okay. please answer your, your question. Yeah, I think that's that's a good detailed enough answer. Uh, we will also uh, put this answer in writing and share with the participants and maybe add a little bit more, uh, bit more detail with your guidance from David and yourself so that the participants get these answers in detail for future references. Uh, Josh, uh, you talked about batteries, and by the way, we do have a question that uh, uh, maybe you can answer, uh, help us answering uh, is about uh, how the batteries have been commercially integrated in different markets in their different market design and especially talk about the challenges you know of integrating batteries and yes. the opportunities and opportunities yes please uh, george go ahead please well as uh, so probably all the audience knows with the increased amount of non-controllable renewables either wind and particularly solar because solar have a pretty standard shape for every day uh, the problem of trying to store energy during these moments in which the solar power, also wind power, but mainly solar power, is uh, abundant or excessive, and to move it to a different moment in the system. This could be considered the basic problem. So how to manage this basic problem into a market environment and uh, what needs to be done if something in order this business, this new technology that is appearing in the system is actually being installed. The initial answer is straightforward. That means, OK, these batteries can be integrated into the system as a load and a generator. That means during some moments it's a load, so they have to pay the, the prices that appear in the market during these moments, and they may use this in other moments in which the prices are higher and the battery is discharged and it acts as a generator. This is the basic, the basic idea of the batteries. However, when you make the exact calculations, what appears nowadays with the current prices of batteries and the current uh, say, trends of the marginal prices, that this arbitration, because this is a name that is normally used in this case, is not enough for paying the full price of a new battery installation. That means there is a gap, a gap that is being reduced gradually, but is still there. 
So for a private investor that decides to install batteries, they say, no, in this moment is not enough the revenues that I can obtain from this battery. In some markets, yes, but in many markets, no. So they need some additional incentive to be installed in the system. How this additional incentive uh, is managed in different markets? Uh, one of the one possibility, and that is, is being used in several countries, is considering that the batteries here are providing a special ancillary service. That means the batteries can be much faster than any other technology for controlling frequency or minimizing the deviations in the in an area or similar. That means that is what is called nowadays uh, past frequency response. Uh, and some markets around the world are paying the batteries for this say new ancillary service. So the owners of the battery have an, another revenue stream that can compensate that. Of course, they can participate also in the ancillary service market with certain restrictions. And this is the way that some countries has found to integrate batteries in the in the system. Say that in many cases, this is not enough. Why? Because many systems do not require this ancillary first service that is a fast frequency response. It's not needed. So there is a service that can be provided, but not, not needed, not that only needed. And so we are in the first problem that how to complete this gap. Uh, and the way that is being uh, done nowadays in several markets is to say, OK, this is a, we need the batteries in the system regardless of the difference in prices between peak and say solar time and, and the evenings. And for that reason, we need somebody needs to procure this service. Why this this why to procure something that theoretically the prices are not reflecting? Well, you because of the right. imperfections of the markets that are not necessarily reflecting the long range marginal cost. And in such cases, the the tendency are two, and in many cases combined, some of them recognizing the batteries some kind of capacity mm -hmm. when they are needed, or right directly tender tendering the new batteries and uh, the system operator or the tenderer in general procures these batteries they pay the owners for such batteries and operate the batteries as are needed by the system or okay. in other cases sorry i completed with that in other cases what they are doing is uh, say okay we recognize that you will receive some revenues from the market but perhaps are not being enough. OK, I will launch a tender for a subsidy. And the guys that are offering a lower subsidy, they are awarded and they install the batteries. So okay. there is no single solution up to now. It's something that is happening every year. There appear new, uh, new approaches, uh, but in general, like this. Uh, the, the okay. Part in the revenue you, uh, from the market and part from the from other sources. Thank you very much uh, for a very elaborated and comprehensive response. Unless David has to add something, uh, we can move to the next question. Just two quick points to add very quick. Right. Uh, a couple of dynamics that, that I think affect the integration of, of battery storage is how quickly and how significantly, uh, particularly solar, is growing. Uh, what we're seeing in markets where there has been significant solar growth is the risk of curtailment is providing another incentive for for installing batteries on the generator side of the meter. So there, so so solar and battery storage are essentially a hybrid uh, resource that is yeah. bidding in into the market. So so the, the the penetration of solar in the market is a big dynamic. Another dynamic is the accessibility of other flexible resources such as natural gas combustion turbines. If you've got that flexibility elsewhere on the grid, then that affects you know the imperative of of getting batteries uh, online more quickly. We've seen that in in several US markets. Excellent. So, David, very interesting yeah, answer. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, no. so just, okay. Okay. Just, I forgot just, about just, this driver also. Sorry. Thank you, David. 
Okay, uh, just a subsequent uh, question, I think, for the benefit of us, all, all of us, uh, if you can further explain that uh, the combination of the batteries and uh, the renewables, wind and solar. So is it already, let's say, commercialized? Uh, or when, what, when do you think that this big change is going to come in very soon or let's say later? It's been commercialized I mean. <laughs> for, I would say, at least four years, uh, okay. but but mostly focusing in the areas, as I said, that are already experiencing significant uh, curtailments of solar due to overproduction uh, during the uh, dur during the middle of the day. Uh, so that provides an additional source of value. That does not necessarily address another huge problem that is coming up, which is um, uh, which is extreme ramps. So if you look at the early afternoon uh, to the early evening, um, that's the point where solar is decreasing in right. its output and load is increasing towards like say that that seven o'clock, eight o'clock peak. The combination of those two create a significant up ramp of gigawatts uh, over maybe a two or three hour period. Um, so storage is is one way to contribute to that, but the magnitude of that ramp uh, is something that you know that requires reliance on other sources of flexibility. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent answer. So, David, uh, uh, the, the question to you now is that uh, one of the participants asked that uh, please explain in detail why we are used for vertically integrated utilities. They still exist in a very advanced market like US. Although I tried to answer it uh, shortly, but you know maybe you can discuss the reason in detail. Sure. There are two quick answers actually. One is economic, and one is political. Um, yeah, as I said. Uh, you know, there's historically been kind of a, a separation of regulatory authority between the federal government and state governments. Uh, you add to that the economic dynamic that in order for a market to work very well, you have to have sufficient liquidity in your in your pool of supply. So, uh, so you know, Omar, Omar saw the the, the the, what you said earlier about uh, RTOs and ISOs serving like 75% of the load in the United States, you showed a map. If you look at the land area corresponding with the RTOs, that was not 75% of the land area. That was that was significantly less. That's because those areas not being served by an ISO or an RTO are less populated. Because they're less populated, achieving that liquidity of supply is not as easy as it is, say, in PJM or Texas or California, where both the load and the supply are more geographically concentrated in the same market. Add to that sort of the, the political nervousness of states to let go of some of their regulatory authority, um, because when you do that, particularly when you have several states in an RTO, um, some states have to give up their regulatory authority and 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 they're hesitant to do that we see the same thing in china uh, and we've seen the same thing in india uh, as i said countries where where the regulation of the power sector has been uh you know, part of it has been part uh, of the central government part of it has been state government that is a tension that each country and each market has to resolve all right. Thank you very much. Uh, one, you know, just a subsequent thing that came across my mind. What do you think that uh, mm -hmm. for the states that are very rich in natural resources like gas, they have, you know, local gas you know, plus uh, oil reserves, etc. So uh, this is also a factor that is holding them, them up not to start a, a comparative market. David? Um, not not really. Not really. I, I would say not not the decision to start a market, um, because particularly natural gas as a fuel source uh, that can be transported across the United States at least, you know, fairly easily. So, so there, you know, with some exceptions, there is you know fairly good access to natural gas. There are other things that sort of limit the ability to to use natural gas. Um, um, Really, the the 
the geographic issue has more to do with access to high quality solar and wind resources. And one project that uh, that I'm involved in right now for the U.S. Department of Energy is looking at uh, renewable energy zones where you've got, you know, concentrations of wind or concentrations of solar with very high capacity factors that would enable high utilization of high voltage transmission to go from one market to another. That's kind of a new frontier for uh, at least for for the United States and and reaching those markets because uh, th these are really inter-regional or inter-market transactions um, and no one has really figured out how to do that from a financial or regulatory standpoint yet. I think you're on mute, Omar Saab. Oh, thank you for pointing this out. So, uh, George and David, thank you so much for being with us and, you know, for your valuable answers. Uh, that would be all for the Q&A session. Uh, dear participants, I, I want to just remind you of certain things. Uh, A, that, uh, you know, signing up in Google Classroom is mandatory because uh, you will get all the spot quizzes and the assignments and everything on Google Classroom. So please spread this word for us. And uh, so that we can, you know, actively engage not only during these eight sessions, nine sessions, you know, after this as well. Uh, I, as I said it, uh, earlier in the orientation session, we are also uh, from Apex and CPPA, we are trying to uh, like develop this le learning management system apart from Google Classroom on our websites so that we have ex exclusive space for our participants to uh, collaborate online, right? So apart from this, uh, my colleague has already posted the discussion forum uh, questions. There are three questions that have been posted. Uh, you have to read a paper, a very interesting paper from Arena. Uh, you go through that, you have a month. So you don't need to you know, uh, haste because a few participants were saying that this is not justified uh, to answer such long questions during this session. It is not required at all, sir. Uh, the thing is that uh, we have made it clear earlier in the orientation session. I'm going to repeat it again that you have time from now till the next session uh, that will uh, be in next month, end of next month to, to go through that, analyze it, and you, you make the post on them. So in, in that discussion room, you can actually collaborate, you can discuss, you can you know, uh, post over the posts of others. So you know, we look forward to receiving you back again in the next session, which is on 25th of uh, next month. So until that time, what we will do is that we will share the individual scores of uh, the test that we have uh, uh, received from, you know, automatically done from the Google Classroom. And uh, until next time, uh, I say goodbye and have a very good day. Thank you very much for attending today's session. Take care.